I'll be very glad to take the greetings of this church back to Maidenbower, and I can assure you that we send our very warm greetings to you, uh, that we pray for you often, and we've prayed for these conferences, and we are grateful to the Lord our God for all his kindnesses to you and to us. And uh, I'd like to say personally how much of a blessing it's been for me to be back with you all again. Uh, it's been a real joy, your kindness, uh, your generosity, your encouragements have been a real blessing to my soul. So thank you uh, in Christ Jesus for those kindnesses. I'd ask you to turn with me to the second passage that we read a few moments ago in Philippians and chapter 4. Philippians and chapter 4. The Apostle tells us in verse 19, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray once more. Lord God, as we study your truth this evening, we do pray that you would take away whatever weariness, whatever distractions there might be, that would stop us hearing and heeding the truth as it is in Jesus. We ask our God that your Spirit would draw near to us to bless each one of us as we come into your presence to worship you as your word is proclaimed. Father, we know that without you we can do nothing and we cannot even profit from the word preached unless the Spirit works among us. So work, O oh God, to convict, to convince, to exhort, to encourage every heart. Do your gracious and sovereign work among us, O Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. These Philippian Christians were generous in their gospel labor. They were, in many ways, Christ-like givers. They were sacrificial in the work that they did. And Paul tells them in this letter just how grateful he is for all of the mercies that he has received at their hand. They had made themselves poor in order to supply the needs of the apostle the Lord, uh, Paul himself. And in doing so, they had showed that they knew what it was to receive that kind of grace themselves. The Christ who was rich beyond calculation, had made himself truly poor in order that they themselves might be rich. And they were expressing the same heart of gracious love to others, including to the Apostle Paul. When they gave these gifts to Paul, Paul was in prison. There was absolutely no way that the Apostle would ever be able to pay back the good things that he had received from them. But when he writes to them, he assures them that they cannot outgive God himself. That whatever good things they have bestowed upon others, the Lord too is well able to bestow good things upon them. They have not forgotten God's servant Paul, and God will not forget them. Now, I think as believers, we too need to learn what it is to give like the Philippians. We need to be conscious of the fact that Christ has given Himself for us, that God gave His only begotten Son. And that should stir up in our hearts a generous spirit, a generosity with our time, a generosity with our energy, a generosity with our money. But perhaps we might be tempted to think what well, it's possible the Philippians or some of them might have thought, well, here we are giving and giving and giving. But is there going to be any return? There may be times, seasons, long periods when perhaps individually or as a church we think, well, we are, we are giving. And there's a lot in the debit column. Our time, our money, our energy, we're investing so much. And yet, if we look over in the, the credit column, we're not getting back what we hoped 
or thought that we might. Perhaps you've been witnessing, telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been giving of yourself. And sometimes that's painful work. It's time-consuming. And it can be disappointing. You think, we're doing all these things, and yet no one's been converted for a while, or at all yet. Or you think of some of the investments that as a church you're making, some of the, the good things that you do, and you think, we're trying so hard, we're trying to do so much, and yet it doesn't always feel like we're getting the blessing that we might have hoped for. You might look at the, the circumstances that you face, the future that you have as a church, and you think of all of those uh, gifts that you've been given and all of the gifts that you have given to others, and you're thinking, will there actually be any payback? Maybe the Philippians, in their poverty, having made themselves poor, that Paul might have what he needed, were wondering, where will the next meal come from? How will we now survive? And Paul assures them that the God who has given will continue to give all that they require so that they might continue to serve Him with the same generous disposition. Paul would assure the Philippians and he will assure us also that gospel investments do bring in God's good time gospel returns. And so, thanking God and the Philippians for their kindnesses to him, he says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So let us begin with a great need that the Philippians have and the great need that we might have. My God shall supply all your need. Every need that you have. Now, if you start to think about that phrase, it can quickly become quite overwhelming. Start, if you like, on an individual level. Start with your life alone. And think of all the needs that you have as a creature, as a sinner, and as a Christian, if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a creature... You need life, breath, and all things. The clothes on your back, the food that you eat, your daily necessities. Perhaps in your individual case, there may be additional requirements that you have. You may have family or friends who depend upon you. As a sinner, you need the grace of God in the Lord Jesus Christ to make you and to keep you whole. You need the fountain opened for sin and for uncleanness to be continually flowing so that all your transgressions might be taken away. As a Christian, you need the sustaining grace of God in Christ that day by day and moment by moment in each day you might not dishonour your God and your Saviour but live to the praise of the glory of His grace. There are material needs and temporal needs, the things that we need in this world, the care of our bodies, provision for our lives. There are our spiritual and eternal needs, those graces and goodnesses from heaven that we require against the sin that remains within us and the struggles and the challenges that we face as Christians without. You think of the breadth of any one individual need. And then the depth of that need. Again, think of your own experience alone. You have present needs. As you sit here, there are things that you are relying on, things that you're hoping for, things that you are expecting. And there are repeated needs. Some of those things you will need again tomorrow. There are varied needs. Your days, your circumstances will change. There are uh, urgent needs. There are things that you perhaps never even knew were going to come. How many of us might wake up tomorrow or receive a phone call or a, an SMS during the night and we might hear there's a problem, there is an issue. You might wake up with a pain. You go to the doctor and the doctor tells you that you've got a, a disease or an illness that you had not expected. 
Something might rush in upon you. There may be some great challenge that you will face individually, even in the course of the next few hours or the next few days, that you never even imagined might come. And that's you. Now think of the other people who are sitting with you and around you. Think of the people that you know well. Think of perhaps people that you have some care for or responsibility for and start adding in all their need. And then think of the church as a whole. Not just as a a mass of individuals gathered together, but all of the work, all of the opportunity, all of the duty, all of the challenges that you face as a congregation. Doing the regular work of God's people in the earth and some of the distinct responsibilities and opportunities that you've been given. You add in something like GMA. You think of the work uh, in the drop-in centre. You think of the Christian Compassion Ministries. Uh, Not every church has these things to take care of. You think of the conference you've just had, trying to minister to and give gifts to, what, 370, 380 men or so over the course of a week. And perhaps you're thinking, oh, we've got to do all that again next year. And there are the missionaries that you're supporting, the men that you're investing in, the families that you are caring for. And this is just one church. Then you had the other ones in Manila and the ones throughout the Philippines. And I think back to what's going on in the UK. And you start heaping all of these things together, individually, and then as a group together. And then as the body of Christ in this place and other places And Paul is, as it were, heaping all that and he's talking about every need that you have. All the need of all the saints. There's a fascinating video on YouTube. You might be able to find it if you search for something like Whirlpool. Um, It's... It's a video, I think it was filmed somewhere in Eastern Europe or perhaps somewhere in Russia. A man is standing on the the edge of a riverbank. And in the river, there are lots of twigs and branches, uh, clumps of earth and and ice, big chunks of ice that are floating past. And just about where you are now, the third or fourth row out there, all of a sudden, as the camera rolls, you begin to see a little swirl of water. And the camera keeps going. And the water turns faster and faster. And you begin to see little twigs and little chunks of ice going into this this whirlpool as it begins to develop. This thing, I think, lasts about 10 minutes. Once you start watching, I find it very hard to look away because this whirlpool gets stronger and stronger. And pretty soon, it's not just twigs and small lumps of ice, but it begins to suck down branches and big Uh, sheets of ice begin to move in and to swirl around. And if you look carefully, you can see out in the distance on the, the lake or the river, wherever it is, you begin to see the pull of this whirlpool dragging things towards it. And it gets bigger and it gets faster and it pulls harder. And before long, they're stepping away from the bank because it's starting to pull chunks of earth, soil away. And it's swallowing it all down. And you think... After they've turned off the camera, how much longer did this go on for? How many things were just swallowed up and disappeared in this whirlpool, this sinkhole that appeared here in the water? And it may be that there are times when your life feels like a whirlpool. When the church life feels like there's just a a great pit that has opened up And it doesn't matter how much you pour in, it just demands more and more. And your need seems to outweigh everything that can be supplied. And perhaps you even wonder, how am I going to get through the next day? How will we survive this week? There's this pressing requirement. There's this crisis that's come up. There's this demand that we didn't expect. And that's on top of all the normal things. And it may seem overwhelming as you try and give and you try and invest and the situation just swallows everything up and leaves you crying out for more. Paul says, that's your need. As individual Christians in Philippi 
as a church of Jesus Christ, my God shall supply all your need. Now at this point you might say, well, I, I had kind of hoped that there might be some encouragement at some point this evening. And so far, all we've done is talk about just how great our needs are. And we've built them up until they seem like a huge, great mass. We've looked at them until they feel like a great whirlpool, sucking all our resources into them. We think of everything that we now face, everything that we will face, everything that we might face, everything we've given, and we wonder if we'll be able to keep on giving. And here you are, emphasizing just how great our need is. Well, brothers and sisters, it's good for us to think about our need. Our need as creatures and as sinners and as servants. Because Paul wants us, as it were, to see all that on one side of a great set of scales. He wants us to pile all that need onto one side of the balance. And in this verse, he begins to address the balance. Because he tells us not only is there a great need, but first of all, there is also a great giver. My God shall supply all your need. All of a sudden, Paul introduces God into the equation. And as soon as Paul introduces God into the equation, the sum begins to change. Because this is the God who had supplied all Paul's needs. All his needs in all his journeys up to this point. This is the God who had even been pleased to use the Philippians' generosity to supply his needs while he was there in prison. This was the God who had been honoured by the Philippians' Christ-like generosity. And Paul says... Remember, this is the God who is acting for us. My God, the one who has taken care of me, the one whom I have preached, and the one whom you have come to trust. Now you think of who this God is. You think even of some of the ways that he is described in the Bible. First of all, he is the God of heaven and of earth. Everything that is made was made by him. It is all sustained by His power. The cattle on a thousand hills belong to Him. Everything is the work of His hands. He is the God of infinite power in creation. Furthermore, He is also called the God of your fathers. Paul would say to the, the Philippians, you can trace back the way this God has always dealt with His people in the past. He has been generous. He has been merciful. He has been faithful. He is the God who has dealt with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, with, with Joseph and with Moses and with David and with the prophets. You know how this God has been lavish in His goodness and in His mercy. He is also described in 1 Samuel 2 as the God of knowledge. There is no need that you have that this God does not know altogether. Everything that you might require falls within His understanding. He is the Lord of hosts. You know what that means? It's a reference to His angel armies. There are countless angels at God's command. And each one of those angels, sometimes called a ministering spirit, is so glorious that when ordinary people see the glory of an angel, they are tempted to bow down and worship the angel. But God is the God of all the angels altogether. That is His glory. That is His majesty. That is His strength. He's described as the God of our salvation. The God who has loved us. The God who has lavished His love upon us. The God who has said, I will be your God and you shall be my people. David calls Him the God of my life. Everything that I am and everything that I have is under His care and control. The God of my strength. All that I have ever needed in order to serve Him has been granted to me. He is the God of mercy. A God who loves to give gifts freely to those who are in need. 
A God of patience and a God of comfort. A God who never wearies of blessing those who call upon Him. A God who delights to do good. He is the God of hope. He is the God who lifts up our eyes so that we do not become despairing. He is the God of peace. The God who loves to ensure that there is a, a wholeness and a sweetness and a beauty and a depth of relationship with Him. He is the God of the Jews and of the Gentiles. His mercy and goodness are not restricted to one nation or another but stretches over all the earth and all the peoples. And He is the God, according to 1 Peter 5 and verse 10, of all grace. A God who loves freely to pour out favour upon those who call on Him. And Paul, having started with all our need, is reminding us that over and against that need, God, the living and true God of heaven and earth, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and full of loving kindness, that God is also in the picture. And I suggest to you that when you think of all your need, it is a good start to think next of all of the God of Paul, the God of the apostles and your God. So you have this great need, yes, but you also have this great giver. And then again, Paul says, we have a great expectation that my God shall supply all your need. If your need feels like a great pit that swallows up everything that is poured into it, Paul is saying here that the Lord God can flood that pit with such an outflow of goodness as to make it overflow in itself. He actually uses the same language here as he's just used in verse 18. He says, indeed, I have all and abound. I am full. The sense is here that Paul is full to overflowing. That God has so blessed him that not only has all his need been supplied, but now he has more than enough. He has something to spare, something with which to be a blessing to others. And I think there's perhaps at least an echo here of the Old Testament language of Psalm 23. I don't know if any of you children have learned Psalm 23. You ever memorized Psalm 23? It's a good one to learn. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And as you work your way through that psalm, you come to a point where David the king is sitting among his enemies. He has many needs. He faces many challenges. And he says that this great shepherd of the sheep makes his cup to overflow even in the midst of his enemies. In the worst of his needs. In the deepest of his distresses. This God... My God has made my cup to overflow. I have a great and sovereign shepherd. I have a royal king in the heavens who looks upon me with an eye of love and kindness and undertakes to supply all my need. This God will look upon me. He will assess all that is taking place in my life or the life of the church. He will consider that need and He can supply all that we need. He can so fill us up as to make us overflow. And there is a sense in which it costs nothing of His infinite strength. We work and we get tired. Our strength is finite. It is limited. But you cannot put a drain upon infinity. My God shall supply all your need. Now it's important here that we remember at least one thing. That the apostle does not say, My God shall supply all your wants. Very often as Christians, we might draw up a list of the things that we want. I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this, and I want this. And sometimes even our prayers can sound more like a shopping list than anything else. The Lord says, I know what you want. 
but perhaps what you want is not what is best for you. I know, says the God of mercy and of grace, I know what you need. I know because you are my child. I know because you are my people. I know because I am the shepherd of my sheep. And you are the sheep of my flock. You are those whom I myself will pastor, will bring to, to green fields and to still waters. I know your needs. You may have many things that you might want, but my undertaking is to supply everything that you truly need. And in that you will find me more gracious than you could imagine, more generous than you can calculate. Here then is the great giver, with the great expectation that he shall supply all your need. And here is his generosity. There is a great store, because this God supplies all our need according to his riches in glory. Now this is a beautiful phrase. This should encourage us, because Paul does not say that God supplies our need out of his riches in glory, but according to his riches in glory in glory, on a scale of heavenly majesty. Now, what's the difference? Well, imagine that I am a billionaire. Okay, you might have to work hard for this, but imagine that I am a billionaire. And I go uh, down on one Thursday evening to the drop-in centre. Now, if I deal with the street people out of my riches... I could give each of them something to eat, each of them something to drink. I could maybe give each of them a new t-shirt, perhaps a skirt or a pair of shorts. And out of my riches, as a billionaire, I have given them something. And you might say, well, that was generous. That was kind of you. You gave them something out of your riches. But what if I dealt with them according to my riches? What if I dealt with them on the scale of my wealth? What if I treated them as a billionaire can treat people? What if I said to each one of them, because I have so great an abundance, because my wealth is almost beyond calculation, I'm not just going to give you something out of my wealth, something to eat, something to drink, something to wear, I am going to deal with you according to my wealth. I am going to clothe you in wonderful garments. I am going to supply you each with a home in the finest parts of Manila. I'm going to stock your larders, your fridges, your cupboards, so that you never need to go hungry again. Do you see the difference? Out of someone's riches, that could be a very small thing. I could give you a few, a few coins, a few pesos out of my riches. But if I deal with you according to my riches, then you see just how great my wealth is. And that's what God does in His dealings with His people. His measure is not even how much we need. His measure in giving is how great are His riches. That infinite goodness, that infinite glory, that infinite grace outweighs our greatest need. When God looks on our real needs, He's not, as it were, shelling out a few pesos, a coin here or there. He wants to show His people how great, how good, how glorious, how majestic, how excellent He is. He wants us to marvel at the wonders of His grace and the greatness of His heart. And so He pours out what He desires and designs to give. Taking into account all our need, yes, but intending to supply it on the scale of His riches in glory. Now what does that phrase actually mean? Well, the commentators do a lot of arguing about this phrase. What does it mean for God to deal with us in accordance with His riches in glory? Well, some people say they're His glorious riches. And you say, well, yes, that would be true. The riches of God are altogether glorious. The things that God gives are glorious. 
Others say, well, that may be so, but they are distributed in glorious measure. That the, the, the flow of them is glorious in itself. Ah, yes, say others, that's true. But the point is that they come from a glorious place. They are heavenly riches. They are divine riches. Yes, say others, true enough, but the point is that they carry us toward a glorious consummation. That is, that they are things that carry us toward glory. They're tending toward a glorious end. Now, it may be because I am not good enough to work out which of those meanings is true, that I like to think that probably all of them are. That this is the sense that Paul is trying to emphasize the lavish, abundant, excellent, glorious richness of God's dealings with His people in Christ Jesus. The good things that God has stored up for us are glorious riches, distributed in glorious measure, coming from a glorious place and carrying us toward a glorious end. And I suggest to you again that perhaps now all your need is starting to look smaller and smaller when you have here my God who supplies all your need according to His riches in glory. A great giver, a great expectation, a great store, and my friends, a great mediator. Because these riches all come to us in or by Christ Jesus. They are all realized, they all come to fruition, they all come into our experience in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that means something perhaps even more than that Christ is the channel through whom they all come. You know, if you make the water flow somewhere, it comes down through a channel. But Paul is not just saying that Christ is the one who, who is the, through whom these gifts flow to us. He is the one in whom they come to us. Now I went to see the boys home yesterday. CCM boys home. I was with you boys in, in your home, yeah? And some of you showed me your cupboards. You remember that? You opened the cupboard and inside there were all their treasures. They had their clothes in there, had some toys in there, had some books in there. Everything precious, apart from one or two stuffed animals on the beds, but everything precious was in that one cupboard. Now if I go home, my boys also have boxes like that. They have their, their treasure chests. And into those chests, they will put all their most precious things. They're all stored in one place. And if you get the chest, if you get the cupboard, you get everything that's inside. And that's Paul's point. That these blessings come to us in Christ Jesus. He is God's treasure chest. He is God's golden casket. And if we are in Him, if we have Him, if He has us, says Paul, then in Him, by Him, God will supply all our need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. He's doing something quite clever here. Too often when we read Paul's letters or any other books, we read them in chapters. We read them day to day, day at a time. If you go all the way back to chapter 1 and verse 1, remember that Paul, Paul's readers here, Paul's hearers, would first of all have heard this as one letter read in its entirety. Look how he begins it. Paul and Timothy, bond servants or bond slaves of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, that is to all of the people who belong to God, in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi. Now that's precisely the same phrase that he uses in verse 19. He started off his letter by reminding God's people where they really were. If I asked you tonight, where are you? You might say, well, we're in Cubao. We're in the church building. We're in Manila, we're, we're in the Philippines, that's where we are. And Paul might say, yes, yes, I know that, but where are you? What's your identity? Where do you really belong? 
You are not just in this place, but if you are a Christian, you are in Christ Jesus. You have a spiritual location, a spiritual identity. You are found in Him. You have died together with Christ. You have risen together to newness of life in and with Jesus Christ. You belong to Him. If you're a Christian, you're united to Him. You can be spoken of and you should think of yourself as in Christ Jesus. And Paul now finishes his letter by reminding them that in Christ, all those blessings of God that meet all our needs are found. If you're in Him then you are sure of every good thing that you might possibly require in order to bring honour and glory to the God of your salvation. Every saving benefit, every blessing that the Good Shepherd will pour out upon His sheep is found in Christ. You see, if you have Him, you have nothing of which to be afraid. If you have Christ, if you are in Him, that is where God has stored up and poured out all His goodnesses. These divine riches of salvation as not just the, the reality of being saved from our sins, but everything that flows out of that. All the delight all the mercy, all the kindness, all the care, all the concern that God continues to show to us. That having saved us, He will go on saving us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will carry us safely through to the end and He shall bring us into His glorious kingdom. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. And God has undertaken to supply all our needs for everything that is required as His pilgrims according to His riches in glory in this same Jesus Christ. Remember how John said, we beheld His glory full of grace and truth. All the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Him bodily. He is the delight of the Father. He is the one in whom we now stand. Christian, you are in Christ and God will deal with you as one who is in Christ Jesus. That's why when we read Romans chapter 8 and we ask, that if God has given us His Son, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? The answer is, it is unimaginable. If you are in Christ, God will never cease to provide all that you need to be all that He requires you to be, to do all that He requires you to do, and to give all that He requires you to give. Are you a creature? And Christ the Creator will watch over you and care for you, giving you life and breath and all things. Are you a sinner still? And the blood which flowed on Calvary's cross will go on cleansing your transgressions as you look to this Jesus in faith. And are you a servant of the Most High God? Then His Spirit will be with you to sustain you, to equip you, to take care of you. And the God of all grace will continue to watch over you every step of your way. See, the great question then must begin, do I have Christ? Does Christ have me? My friend, are you in Christ? You realize what it is to live without Him. You realize how exposed you are. You realize how endangered you are. In Christ, God undertakes to supply every need we might have outside of Christ as a creature. In all your weakness, in all your feebleness, and in all your emptiness. 
you have no protector. As a sinner, outside of Christ, you are under the wrath and curse of a holy God and you will be exposed to His judgments in the horrors of hell for all eternity unless you find a covering for your sin. And in your life in this world, you can do nothing because you do not have a Christ who strengthens you. Until you come to Christ, you cannot enjoy these mercies. You cannot enjoy these blessings because all God's mercies for those upon whom He sets His love, they are all found in and with Jesus Christ. But you boys, you girls, you get God's treasure chest and you get all God's treasures. You get Christ and in and with Him you have all these good things assured. It is not a promise that life will be easy. It is not a promise that you will never be sick. It is not a promise that you will always be wealthy. It is not a promise that you will have a husband or a wife. It's not a promise that you will have a large family. Not a promise you have a big house and a fast car. It is a promise that as God's child, every Thing you need as God's people everything you need as God's church and Christ's bride everything you need will be supplied by God in Christ Jesus for you so as you think about that Christian you who have Christ Jesus you are in Christ Jesus I want you to look in two directions I want you first of all to look backwards. Experience can look backwards. Can I ask you this seriously? What have you ever lacked that you really needed? What have you ever lacked that you really needed? Remember, we have to be careful. We're not saying, what have I ever wanted that I didn't get? <laughs> What have you ever needed that you did not receive? In times of crisis, in times of sorrow, in times of joy, in times of fear, in times where you were just getting on with life day by day, in times where you didn't know perhaps when the next meal was going to come from, in times when you weren't sure how you would take care of yourself or for your family. Or you think of when, like the Philippians, you have given, you have uh, made efforts and investments. Perhaps you have labored long and hard in some area of Christian service and you've thought, oh, will this ever bring fruit? But I ask you, has God ever been in your debt? Have you ever had reason to, as it were, shake your fist at heaven and say to the God of all grace, you have not dealt kindly with me? My friend, the very fact that you can name the name of Christ, the very fact that you are spared hell and promised heaven, would mean that if you lived and died in the most distressing poverty or pain, you would still have cause to give thanks to the God of your salvation. He has met your needs and He would sustain you and bless you and keep you even in the depths of your sorrows. Perhaps you're still waiting Perhaps you're in this distress now and you're asking, will we receive? Yes, according to His riches in glory. Cry out to your God in your need. Lay it all before Him. Think back to when you've done it in the past. God has always been God to us. The very fact that we who are Christians sit or stand here this evening is a testimony that God has never left us or forsaken us. My friend, has God not met your needs? Has God not met your needs today? Is the Lord still not meeting your needs as pilgrims on earth or citizens of heaven? Look back. Look back and gain assurance that the promises of God have always proved yes and amen in Jesus Christ.
Look back through the eyes of experience and then look forward with the eyes of expectation. Because if you are anything like me, you have an instinct to take care of yourself. In English, we have a phrase. We call it the nest egg. I don't know if you have that, uh, you know that idea. A nest egg is the savings that you've got tucked away in case you ever need them. We talk about saving for a rainy day in England. You know, just in case trouble comes, I'm going to have to take care of myself. I need to watch my own back. I need to make sure that I'm looking after number one because no one's going to look after me. And can you imagine what that does to your heart? How that starts to shrivel you up? Well, I'll take care of them after I've taken care of myself. I'll think about those people once I've thought about my situation. I've got to look out for myself and only then will I have time to take care of other people. Only then will I have something to give to others. Are we willing to let God be our shield and our defender? Are you willing, am I willing to live a Christ-like life of service, investment, giving, sacrificial pursuit of the glory of God with the confidence that my God shall supply all our needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Isn't it too easy for us to say, well, I, I can't do that. I won't do this. I won't, we've already done this, we've already tried that, we're, we're being stretched, our resources are tight, yes, but the resources of God are never stretched. The wealth of God cannot be exhausted. The strength and the mercy and the goodness of our Heavenly Father are infinite, eternal and unchangeable in the heavens. And we have an assurance here that if we live to the praise of the glory of God with Christ-like hearts, that our God will supply all our need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. What then can we do? What then should we do? We should go on giving. Time, energy, money, people. We should go on serving we should go on investing. And we should go on, as the psalmist said, like a servant looking to the hand of the Master in heaven. My friends, I don't know everything that faces any one of you individually. I can't begin to calculate what faces all of us as individuals here in this building this evening. I don't know all of the challenges, all of the opportunities, and all of the demands that you have as a church. And I cannot begin to imagine what it is to look across the globe and to see Christians gathered into churches in every place and to think of all your need. Humanly speaking, utterly overwhelming. But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And that, my friends, is our confidence. That is our thanksgiving. That is our hope. And that is our joy. We can look back and we can say, even with tears, remembering times of distress and grief and pain, what have we needed that our God has not provided and with that experience and this confidence, we can look ahead and we can say, what will He not now also give if it is needful for us? He has given His Son that we might not die but live. How will He not with Him also freely give us all things? This means, brothers and sisters, that we should praise Him for His mercies past and humbly hope for more. Amen.